Hi, everyone. Welcome to Getting on Top. I'm your host, Paul Morris. We're here Wednesdays from 4 to 4.30 p.m. That's East Coast time. We broadcast from the southern Hudson Valley region of New York State. The you out of town is it's just the uh, northern suburbs of New York City, my hometown. Multi-talented person who's our guest today. Her name is D- Diane James. And uh, the uh, show today is Live Your Everything with Diane James. Uh, master of si- uh, she has a master's in, of science degree. And Diane is an award-winning author speaker, actor, and transformation coach. She's the author of the book, The Real Brass Ring, Change Your Life Course Now. Diane says, I'm in a midlife, I am, I'm a midlife reinventionist. I tore down my perfectly traditional life and retooled it, piece by painful piece, not because I wanted to, but because on the inside I was dying. Now I am an actor, author, entrepreneur, coach, and I invite you to start creating your best life forever. You can find out more about Diane and what she does at www.liveyoureverything.com. And uh, Diane is calling in from the Chicago area. Hi, Diane. How are you? I'm good, thanks. Thank you so much for having me, Paul. My pleasure, my pleasure. And um, so um, you've done a number of things. I did read your book, so I know something about your life. And uh, I know how hard it is to uh, to change uh, things in, in midlife. Uh, I'm a bit beyond that stage, but I remember going through that myself and having my midlife crises, and uh, it takes a lot of courage to uh, get up and, uh, you know, and change things, especially leave a marriage. Uh, So, you know, uh, how do people get the courage to do such a thing? Or to to make whatever change they need to make at, at that stage of the game? Well, that's an excellent question. Um, my, we've taken, at least I'm trying to take the midlife crisis and kind of turn it on its ear to become a midlife reboot. Um, I, I was in a particularly challenging situation because, um, well, first of all, I, I learned about the fact that I needed to change, not really from myself, but I went to, as you, as you might have read, I went to see Sonia Choquette. She's internationally known psychic, but this was about 10 years ago. And I went to see her in her home, and she, for an hour, I thought she was going to tell me that I had everything all sewn up, that I was a cat's meow, and keep going, you know, keep going, girl, you're right on track. But instead, she called me out on everything. She's like, you're this unlit Christmas tree. My career was off track. She said, you know, my marriage was fraternal. I was basically in, like, girlfriend relationship with my husband at the time, that everything about what I had, trappings, you know, the big house, the, the, the cute car, the fancy shoes, all that stuff was off, and I was supposed to be this writer, healer, teacher, and an actor. And she also, she was polite enough not to call this out, but I was also 190 pounds at the time. And she said, you are chronically and clinically depressed. But I didn't tell her, but I was popping those little white pills at the time, you know, when Prozac was super popular and everybody, you went to the doctor and they just kept handing you scripts for Prozac. So she was right. But mine wasn't just a little change. It was like a macro reboot. It was every single aspect of my life was completely off. So as far as the courage aspect of that, it took... It took me a while because I think I moved into the state of overwhelm at first. It's kind of hard for someone to say, you know, everything you have, just trash it and start over, especially when you have three kids and, you know, you have to feed them and worry about worry about how to support yourself and put a roof over everybody's head. So it, it was kind of a, it was a big deal for me. It took me 10 years, but I had to take it kind of like piece by painful piece and do every single thing that she mentioned, but I had to do it over time. It took me a long time, but eventually, you know, I lost 55 pounds, and I um, I did go back to theater, and now I'm a SAG actor, and I, I do that, you know, p- films and TV, whatever whatever opportunities come along, and had the chance to start, finish the book. 
She told me to write a book. I didn't even know what she was talking about, Paul. I was like, what book are you talking about? I thought I was supposed to write a marketing book because I was a marketing consultant. So I kept thinking, oh, she wants me to write like a marketing, like a how to, how to you know, market widgets. So I kept sitting down to kind of write that book. But instead, what kept pouring out very organically were all these like really dramatic stories and you know, juicy details of my life that you really, I never thought I'd put on paper. But I put the whole thing down and it just kept like oozing out. So so part of it was just really getting in touch with the heart space. That's where I think a lot of the courage starts. And then part of it is 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 the action piece. And I like to call the whole thing like accountable authenticity. Because we sometimes we know what we need. It's to write that out, though. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> oh, you know, I'd say some people would find that to be, you know, just an easy task. For me, I, it wasn't. It wasn't super easy. I think it was unnatural <laughs> rather than natural. But when I finally plugged in and put my, actually made myself put those keys on on the on the keyboard, it just flew out of me. So the nice thing is, I think it was guided by spirit quite a bit. But I also think a lot of it was just overcoming. Well, you know, the biggest the biggest battle of all is overcoming the fears that stand in your way. You know. Oh, yeah. What if you put something out and nobody looks at it? What if you put something out and everybody looks at it? What if people walk away? What if people don't like me anymore? You know, really overcoming the deep, deep, deep fears. That's the hardest part of the journey. Sure. Well, I know when I read, I, I wrote a novel, uh, uh, oh, God, it must have been about 25 years ago, and I had never done anything like that my whole life. I, I was, you know, I was kind of shy, actually. And just the thought of, writing something that everyone could read scared the hell out of me. But I, I needed I needed to express myself. I had to, you know, that was my first uh, midlife crisis. I had to express myself somehow. It was, it, it, you know, it was driving me crazy. The only way I, you know, I made a pact with myself. One, I wouldn't be so, you know, I'm, I'm kind of anal about those things. I'd write a sentence and think about it for you know forever, and I made a I made an agreement I would just write whatever came out of me, and the next time I would fix it up. And the other thing I had to do was meditate on seeing this thing, you know, being a bestseller or something, which it wasn't unfortunately, but uh, you know, just to get to feel positive about it, and I'd have to do that every day. But you know, once it was over, I was a different person. You know, once and I got it I, all out, I felt so much more confident. Well, congratulations for doing it, because I think that's amazing. No, seriously, because there's so many people that, that talk about what they want to do, but what I had to do, a little trick I used to, to help me overcome all the resistance, I had tons of resistance on the inside, I kept sure. <laughs> scaling my goals. I think the problem was at first my goal was really big, kind of like yours. Oh, you know, it's got to be a bestseller, or it has to be you know, right, the you know, right. New York Times list. And then... That would actually stop me dead in my tracks because that was too scary, too hard. I mean, what if it doesn't happen? Then I'm, the, you know, failure. The, you know, it's like you have both. You have the polarity. What if it's a, what if it's a success? But what if it's a failure? Both of which are can can stop you. You know, can be a really big halt. So what I did is I actually kept scaling back my goals. <laughs> Sounds kind of silly, but um, I said to myself, okay, if one person is helped at all. If one person is, you know, slightly encouraged, motivated, or even if my daughter, who um, at the time was maybe 12, 13 when I started writing it, if she gets anything from this and her friends have a better life because maybe they saw their mom do something that was kind of tough to do, then I win. So I started really making the goals. The why was super, super, super achievable. And that's something that really worked for me because I think it's those the walls that we put up around these aspects of of fear and they usually fall into three camps you know it's it's usually either like lack of self-worth or self self-love like what if i'm not good enough or somebody figures out i'm i'm not i'm not a writer and i'm not i can't put words together or you know what if there's a lack of means what if i write this thing and then we all of a sudden can't eat you know there's no way to feed ourselves or you know some of the third ones is and this is the biggest one for me was lack of acceptance which is love from others what if everybody walks away and i had a my my original my family is from very much you know old school irish german really rigid with the views about don't let the neighbors see you don't let them know what's going on never tell the neighbors the truth because you know we always want to have that perfect little image 
So I had to go against something I had been trained to do, which is to keep your mouth shut and walk that straight line. And and that was the hardest part, actually, I think, thinking that I'm going to end up alone and no one will ever talk to me again. And and so I think that was my biggest biggest resistance area. So how did you feel? It must have been like a coming out party. I mean, once <laughs> once you did it, it was like a breath of fresh air, I bet, huh? Yeah, it was. It was okay. Was. I'm still alive. <laughs> I I'm did still it. here. I'm still alive. <laughs> <laughs> wow. You know, it, it was. Gee, what it can was, I do next, was, right? <laughs> well, there was a lot of pushback. They always say, what is a prophet's not welcome in his own hometown? <laughs> so, so the only pushback I, I had was, was from people who were the closest to me. Isn't that funny? Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's been out for um, just a year, and it, the external world was loving it. It was great. I got so many beautiful, beautiful messages about that. But the inside, when I had to deal with the family and their reaction to it, we had the worst holiday ever. It was just, you know, it's going to be in the next book, of course. I didn't put it in this one because it was already out. But the stuff that people went through because I broke all the rules and, uh I think I was perceived as disloyal, and you know, yeah. You know, what can I oh. say? It's a juicy, it's a juicy story I, with a, a lot I, of truth pouring out of it. You know, so I don't think everybody, I don't think everybody appreciated it. <laughs> no, I, I really I, hey, <laughs> I understand. My my son was like that too. That just when I was trying to give myself that oomph to write that novel, I put the, the original name, which I changed on my on my. Uh, a car or a bumper, my plate, license plate, and my drove my son crazy. He was, he was embarrassed. <laughs> it was called Pioneers, and he couldn't stand it. And first chance he got, I don't know how he did it. Somehow he changed my plate. Seriously? But, no, I, I know, I know how you feel. I know how you feel. Let me get to uh, time is running. We do have a bit, a, a little more time than thirty minutes. The live portion of the show will end, but. The uh, transcribed portion will go on for another about 10 minutes after that, so we can go a little over. But I really do want to get to the healing, you know, part, the coach part, because that's, you know, something I'm involved in as well. And, yeah. uh, you know, I like, I'd like to talk about that uh, if possible. So sure. what made you, uh, you know, become a, a coach, you know, transformational coach? Well, part of it uh, was, uh, again, uh, these are just, I always think of the path. I always thought the path is straight and linear, but, you know, the path is jagged. <laughs> you go a little to the right, little to the left, little to the right. Uh, my, the first part of the path actually came from going to um, this place called Hoffman Institute. And uh, they're in California. They're actually in 90 different countries, and now I think like 90,000 people have gone through. And what they do, I had, and, and everyone's different, but I had a steamer trunk full of negative messages, um, programming that was inauthentic to me, everything that Sonia called out about being a good girl and about following those rules and, you know, get your big, you know, get a degree and do this and that and then have a family and this many kids and by this date. So I was so well programmed that I think that's the reason that I was sick in the head and physically unfit. So I had to go and get rid of that. And for me, I had I needed help from the outside. So the first step of my journey was to go to Hoffman Institute seven days it's a program where I call it emotional rehab. No TV, no cell phone, nothing but you and and this beautiful group and these beautiful teachers who really allow allowed me to excavate everything that wasn't real. You know, you you go through all all of the emotions in a huge way. You know, you cry, you cry a river of tears. You get rid of everything that that wasn't the way you would have preferred it to be growing up, and you come back this brand new spanking soul. Like I like as a baby soul, you know, you're rebirthed, and so that was one of the first things I had to do because I had a work? lot of it. It, it changed everything. Yeah, it changed everything. Okay. It gave me the courage to show up, and you know, when you're 190 pounds, you don't really. It was hard to show up as an actor because I wasn't skinny and I wasn't had no experience. I mean, I had had an experience since high school, so you know, it gave me all the courage to overcome every of the main obstacles that were standing in my way. And since then, what I started doing is taking a lot of those tools and teaching and then offering the workshops. Because in theory, we could have anything we want, you know, using the, the, the laws of metaphysics. If you think about it, you bring, you know, whatever you think about, you bring about. So in theory, sure. if you think about anything, it could come your way. So what I've noticed is it's that 
the, it's the blocks and the stops, as I'm sure you know, Paul, because this is a main area of your you know focus. The blocks and the stops are what's getting in the way, and that excavation is is the biggest challenge for people. The clarity sometimes can be a challenge, but it's more so about what are all those dark, what is all the darkness and the shadow that's standing in your way. So Hoffman is part. Of, if you have a big steamer trunk, Hoffman's a great place to go. In seven days, you come out, and it's basically 15 years of therapy in seven days. So it's cheaper, wow. <laughs> probably cheaper than the therapy. It's less time, and it's extremely effective. And after that, I use a lot of tools that are just really, in in the workshops that we do, we use a lot of tools to get through that, uh, to get through all those levels. You know, like kind of like the elevator levels of heavy stops, light stops, you know, medium stops, and we we break them down. And and let me here's just, just ask a question before you go into. I'm sorry. Yeah. No, go ahead. Before you go into that. Yeah, I just want to back up a second. A couple of questions. Uh, one thing, a comment is, you know, I can imagine because we we just, you know, we talked off the air, you know, a couple of weeks ago, and I understand you're a very creative person who likes to learn new things and, you know, uh, and so on. And it must have been hell. I mean, my parents weren't like that at all. We basically were left alone. We had, <laughs> we had, you know, we we brought ourselves up. I mean, they were there, you know, but. They didn't tell us what to do, you know. They could have told us something, but they didn't tell us very much. So we kind of figured it out ourselves. So I didn't have that problem, but I can I I can't cannot imagine, you know, being raised in a family like that. How that would just absolutely be destructive for someone so creative and imaginative as yourself. The other thing I want to say is most people come out of something like that, but they don't become teachers right away. So that's you know uh, that's quite good. That you know, not only you got helped in a week. I mean, that's that's pretty quick. Most people, you know, go traditional therapy for years, and often nothing changes. So to make that kind of change in such a short time, obviously you were ready to go. <laughs> well, I think you, you, I think you may have a like... trunk full of bad stuff, but you also had your bags <laughs> packed to move forward too. Because well, you that's... know, I know. You know, people don't want to change; they don't change. So you were ready to, you were ready. You were on a platform waiting for the train there, right? <laughs> exactly right. And I think, I think part of it is that, you know, the, I, I call it like your endowment. You know, what, what, are, what gifts have you been given from the very beginning, which you probably always knew were there, but you haven't right. activated. So yes. uh, fortunately for me, you know, I'd always kind of put the training and the teaching into my marketing business, and that was as I say, as easy as breathing. Standing up and doing a lecture in front of 25 or 100 CEOs never never moved me at all. It was just so easy. You know, I'll oh, get up and we do this. And it was effective and fun. So to transfer it into this space is even more fun because I, I, think, I think we're all pretty transparent. And another person who's looking from the outside, let's say I'm looking at a client, I can see pretty clearly as they're speaking I can see when the light comes on. I can see when the light goes off. I can see when they're oh, speaking yeah, yeah. from their head. I can see when they're speaking from their heart. So the nice thing is about the the aspect of coaching and helping others is that it is partly intuitive, partly a gift, and, and partly it's just all there ready to come out. So so that's why, I, again, it was just a really natural, easy easy transition. So right. that, that and, I'm, and I'm very blessed. I'm very blessed. Everything has been um, nicely has, has come together. So I'm just fortunate. Well, obviously you have a lot of gifts in that area. I mean, most people would rather die than speak, you know, the old saying about, you know, speaking at someone's funeral. They'd rather be in the coffin, some people, than be speaking, you know. But uh, <laughs> you, you obviously didn't have that problem. So, you know, to get up and just transfer what you learned uh, to others, you know, uh, well, it's great. I mean, you know, we need... We need a lot of help in this world. There are a lot of people who need who need help and need to, you know, be uh, encouraged to have courage, as I say, you know, as I believe. And I, I think the big the big uh, demarcation is is the ones that people want to change and people don't want to change. And a lot of people come to these things and go to therapy who don't want to change, which sounds counterintuitive, but it's true. I mean, I, I know a lot of therapists, and they tell me these things all the time. How many people make appointments, and half of them don't even show up, and so on. So, uh, 
you know, helping the, people feel comfortable. You know, so I, my point is half of the challenge is just encouraging people and helping them feel comfortable to make the change. You know, even though they know they could throw the switch and change, they won't often won't do it. But they, you know, they're afraid of what you know the devil they know and the devil they know, if you will. And uh, you know, they're afraid to go through the doorway. They don't know what's on the other side, and they have to trust you that it's better over there in the light. <laughs> uh, so, you know, I, I I think I think you know a very positive way of doing it, you know, with your acting background, I think could help people. Because often people aren't as outgoing who are who do this kind of thing. And so uh, I'm just saying it, it might be better, you know, someone like yourself to help people because you're, you you know, you seem to have the, uh, a way, you know, uh, with yourself and, in, in, in the, you know, the way, the way you communicate. So... Anyway, and I, 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 hope I, made I agree a point with you. That was worthwhile. <laughs> no, I, I agree so, with you uh, that uh, especially what the is point your biggest about, challenge you find when you're training, when you're helping people. Let me ask you that. What is it? What is the biggest thing you feel you have to overcome? And I know what you mean when you say you could. And I do that too. I see people and I can't help it automatically. I, I kind of evaluate them, <laughs> how comfortable they are. You know how, and you know do they. Are they depressed, uh, you know, and so on and so forth? And that's a, that's a great tool to have in your tool chest. But what, what's the biggest uh, thing that you find uh, to overcome with people that you're trying to help? Well, I think you you were touching on it earlier, and your point was excellent. That the the point about the willingness. I mean, any change, any change at all, has to come from within. And I think that that's something that we think. Oh, if I get a different house, or if I just change my job. Yeah. Or what if I dump this? <clears throat> I dump my, you know, my partner, and I go find another boyfriend. That is not. It's all the external world that I think we were trained to think. Keep changing the external. The inside's going to get better. As we know, that doesn't. That really doesn't work. So you could talk about that all day long in therapy for hundreds of years. It isn't going to help you. So the internal change is the part where the focus needs to be, and that is the greatest challenge. And what I've found is that there are some clients. And these these are all people who feel lost, they feel empty, alone, or they turn around that one day, which I think we all have, and said, is this really my life? Did I end up here, you know, I'm 45 years old, or I'm 50 years old, or I'm 55 years old. I can't believe this is what I have, because I thought it would be X. So one of the greatest challenges, I think, is is realizing that, you know, your expectations were just that. They were just expectations. So the first thing you have to do is love where you are because you can't really create from a place of lack, as you know, so many people have found. They'll talk about it, talk about it, talk about it, but you're still coming from, I don't have any money and I, I hate my job and you know this isn't working out for me. So we have to always try to help shift the mind. So one of the best tools I've found, and I have them in the book, those, um, you know, the shortcuts for happy living have been very, very, very helpful with, with all of our clients because there's 14 rules for how you really need to change. Start with the change today, how you think about things, how you're looking at things. And one, for example, you know, is just the wave. We're, we're, we're beings of light. We are energy waves. Those energy waves are not straight and linear. They're, they're curved. So I try to really help people always reach for the thought that feels better. So you're shifting your mind because – Situations happen all the time that we may not like or aren't don't seem great at the time. And I'll, I'll just give you, you know, just one example. You know, I'm in a situation where I did work for a client, and I'm not getting paid right now. And it's a big amount of money, and all this stuff is going on. And so I have the opportunity to say, okay, for the first time in 20 years, someone isn't paying me. What's the lesson in it? How do I want to respond to this? And what can I do to make this? And I hate to say it, but a positive experience or a more um, a more neutral experience, because it's not fun. It's something where you have to say, okay, is the lesson that I have to defend myself? Is the lesson I have to go after these people? Is the lesson I need yes. to be patient? And or is it? <clears throat> this is a really funny thing, Paul. I think I realized they're going through this experience because they're being challenged with overcommitting, and I think I'm just kind of along for the ride because 
I'm willing to take whatever steps, you know, whatever t- steps it takes to work it out. Mm-hmm. So I'm always trying to help clients evaluate what's your part in it, what are you supposed to get out of it, and this is the biggest question of all, and it's always the trick, you know, it's always the one that people um, kind of laugh at, and that's how often have you dealt with this issue? Because isn't that the one that the therapists always talk about? You know, the same person comes in and they, they talk about the fact that, you know, my husband won't get off the couch and he doesn't contribute and we never go out. And it's then they'll have the same conversation. My husband doesn't get off the couch. He, he didn't take out the garbage. Now, you know, I mean, whatever it might be that's got you stuck, first of all, you're focusing on the other person instead of changes you can make for yourself. And secondly, that's a repetitive issue, which means it's one of your lessons, one of your life lessons. So the question is, what is it, and how do you move forward? And when I think people look at things a little differently, they can see, wow, the same kind of. And, and one of the one of the best stories in the book that everyone seems to really like is I was attracted to this incredibly hot, incredibly good looking, but this massive world class alcoholic. And I went down this dark road. Everything about life you're not supposed well, to. Let go me through. let me interrupt you for a second. We're going to yeah. go off live, and I just want to identify the show, and then we could continue. Okay, sorry to interrupt. You're listening to Getting On Top on Blog Talk Radio. We're here Wednesdays from 4 to 4.30 p.m. And um, if anyone wants to, we're going to go beyond the uh, 30 minutes. If anyone wants to hear the whole show, uh, you just need to listen to the podcast, and which will be immediately uh, recorded after the show. And uh, my guest today is Diane James, and we're talking about Live Your Everything. And you can find out more about her at www.liveyoureverything.com. Okay. Go ahead, Diane. Okay. Uh, well, we were talking about the fact that by some strange occurrence, which I seem to, I never thought I'd do this, ever, I put on this nurse's uniform and I started trying to rescue a grown 40-year-old man from all of his own all of his own darkness you know everything trouble with the law and sickness like i've never seen and taking a perfectly beautiful situation and turning it into a nightmare day in and day out and i was right in there i have to say like a person who was brainwashed or not even in this world i mean i was doing all this stuff and i half the time people were saying to me who i loved who are you? Why are you doing this? This isn't the Diane we know. So when you walk, when you see yourself in a situation like that, and unfortunately it took almost this incredible crisis where I got almost hurt for me to stop, but that stop was one of the best life lessons I ever had. I was doing, you what know, the you codependent. Learn? I was a codependent. As much what as he was a world class. What did you learn from the uh, situation? I learned to see, smell, feel, taste anyone who has addictions. And I can see it coming a mile away now. I've learned to temper my own reaction to it, which is um, somehow programmed as a rescuer, and to walk and to walk into the situation with my eyes open, knowing that I could get kind of hooked into that. And I, I have been very fortunate since then. It's all been healthy, conscious, loving, kind of mutually beneficial relationships since then. I've never had anything like that, and I, I hope this lifetime I don't. Um, but it was the wake-up call. I needed the wake. I needed someone to, you know, step out in the street and have that bus almost hit me, almost run right over me, for me to to finally realize that that kind of addiction is not the life I want to live this time. That may have been who knows where it's from or how many times I've done that in the past. But I wasn't going to do it anymore. So that that part shifted permanently. It took a lot of drama, but it did work. So I was very I was very fortunate, you know, to see both hell and heaven <laughs> together so 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 let me ask you you know we have about uh less than 10 minutes um what kind of techniques uh, did you receive in that 10 days or that two week and uh, what kind of techniques do you use in, you know what i obviously can't go into detail in general that you uh use uh with your clients to make well, ch- help change I can. Uh, there's a lot of different ones. Uh, Hoffman uses probably maybe ten different techniques. Part of it is, um, is of course meditation, and these are ones that I also use. We have the answers. Everybody already has the answers, not only for their life path and their course 
and their, you know, their dharma, their destiny, but they also know how they wanted to contribute to life. So we use a lot of meditation which gets into reconnecting with the heart and allowing that voice of spirit to actually communicate. So that's one of the main ones. Um, Hoffman uses a lot of gestalt type of, of techniques where they use a lot of physical movement and activities um, to move through the pain. And one of the things when you go there, it is kind of a secret. <laughs> it's kind of a secret camp in that we don't share specifics because it's out of context and out, it wouldn't make total sense yeah. if you're not there. But there is yeah. a lot of physical release. And that's something that kind of surprised me. I didn't, I didn't realize that I always tell people, bring your sweatpants and a, and a shirt because you're going you're gonna to sweat and you're going to want to change your outfits. But don't wear anything fancy because <laughs> there's no point in it. It's really you your baggage, and your teacher. And so you don't have to look good. And that's the nice thing. You get really raw and very real. So a lot of that is It sounds like primal um, scream. It It is. It is. Primal scream, yeah. Okay. And one of the things you can do at home, which is kind of similar, but it makes it kind of easy, um, you know, if you're having a bad breakup or there's something that really hurts inside, what I have found to be really helpful is to like maybe get a path. I'm in Chicago, so we have the path along the lake. But get on that path and run as hard and as fast as you can until it almost, you know, you're so winded you almost can't breathe because that's how far you go with Hoffman. You get to the point where you you feel the pain actually moving out of your body and out of your cells and because we're, it's all cellular. It's all stuck in there. And when you move, you run that hard, and I, I had a horrible breakup with another one when I was, I was a single for a while who, you know, just um, – another uh, rough relationship, and I ran it out, sat, sobbed at the lake. I think I had like 100 people passing by. I didn't care. You know, I'm just sitting here facing the lake. It was me in the water. Sobbed till I couldn't breathe anymore, and it it was a release, and I was able to move on very quickly after that. So I think we, I think we underestimate how much is stuck inside our cells and how we need to actually get it out of the body. And then, yeah. and then of course, of course, part of it is, journaling you know there's always there's the first step of manifestation is to write paper you know pen pen to paper or if you want to put it on a keyboard that's fine but you have to manifest it and make it real in this world so people really underestimate the value of going back to you know the old fashioned we used to have those handwritten journals well going back to that kind of thing where you're actually writing down things it doesn't exist it exists if you do speak about it but it exists in this world in, in real form if you write it so a lot of it is journaling and processing that way. And then part of it is, of course, the therapeutic and the dyads where you work with another person where there's a prompt and a response, prompt and a response. It's funny how much we have all the answers, but if someone asks you the right question, that answer will flow from you as if, you know, you know, what is your name? <laughs> My name is Paul Morris. You know, I mean, those answers are, are not far from the surface. It just really helps to have a partner in that. So in, in the coaching and in the consulting and all the workshops, we work together, and that's what's really fun to watch, to watch two strangers, never met, sitting there, becoming instantly connected and, and helping each other with these triggers and to move past it. So that's like some of the simple stuff that we do to get to uh, the key issues, and then some of the deeper ones we, can, we work with more on one-on-one coaching. Mm-hmm. So uh, a couple of things you mentioned here, um, uh, change, it, you were talking before about change the outside. They People think, you know, it, it's an old story. If you get a bigger house, blah, 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 you know, you'll always be happy, but it's never, you know, it never changes the uh, what's going on. You have to change the inside, not the outside. And... Um, I actually did meet. I actually do know someone who finally got a, a house that made them happy. <laughs> I must. <admit. laughs> it was a real, real nice house. They lost it unfortunately. That's a whole other story. But they, she was finally happy, and uh, I was like, "Wow!" <laughs> so maybe it is possible. <laughs> you know, very few, few and far between. But this one actually happened. And I scratched my head, but. Uh, yeah, so it's about taking responsibility, right? Giving up their mm-hmm. victimhood, 
And you know, and I love the story about the uh, the old vaudeville story about the guy, you know, looking under the lamppost, and you know he seems a little drunk, and it's late at night, and the cop comes by and says, you know, can I help you? He says, I'm looking for my key. He says, where'd you lose it? He says, over there, and he points towards the door, you know, and and he says, well, why are you looking over here, you know, by the curb, you know, on the lamppost, and and the punchline is the light's better here. You know, and then boom, 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 you know. <laughs> and, but, you know, it, it, but there's a lot of truth to that. You know, there's, for people who keep getting bigger houses or whatever, it's, the light's better there for them. It's easier for them to make money, perhaps, but not easy to go inside to look where they know where it is. But they look where it's easy to look, you know what I'm saying? So it's kind of like... There's a lot of truth to that, you know. It, 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 you know, you could use it as an analogy for the way people, you know, are afraid to look inside. <laughs> I don't know what they think they're going to find, but you know, somehow they're afraid to go there, and uh, so you know, they need, well, they need. I guess they need encouragement. Yeah. I challenge everyone to redefine life richness, because I think we have. I think the movement has definitely started at least over the last maybe five, ten years, where life richness used to be that. How big is your house? How big is your car? You know, do you have the best, most recent cell phone? And, you know, for girls, it's like, do you, your nails painted the right color? And I I believe we're shifting. I see it. I see it in the workshops. I see it. I, right. we're, we're, I'm traveling at expos all over the country. And the people who come up and, and speak and speak to, to me and work with us in this in our booth, we're redefining richness together. And and it's more about it's okay if you I liked my I had a big house and I loved it it was so much fun. However, along with that came the big bills, all the expenses, the thing fell apart, and I didn't want the heaviness and the burden of keeping it up. So that was a real mixed bag for me on the just touching on the big house thing. Somebody's got to pay for that thing and keep paying yeah. for that forever. Yeah. So. I don't know. I've, I've shifted what richness meant, and I think I'm seeing a lot of people shift that the richness for me is about being portable, mobile, um, yeah. having, yeah. having. Um, I mean, seriously, having a peaceful household where I have three kids, so you know, make sure whoever's coming in and out, we, you know, we're we're really clean and clear in our communication, and I don't think there's any uh, festering. And so I'm really defining richness, hopefully for myself, and, and you know, modeling it, and then helping others to to really take a look at what that means. Because I don't think anyone on their deathbed, you know, says, "Boy, I wish I had that. I wish I had the house." You know, the, I went from the mini mansion to the mega mansion. I don't. I don't think we say that. You know, <laughs> we we forget that this is a, a limited window, and we get to really craft joy through this richness. Well, you know, actually, as you were saying, and I, I, I remembered that even though this place was, you know, the palace person wanted it, also with their downfall. You, know, you were mentioning the bills. The bills got too much and it couldn't be paid, but she found it so hard to give it up that, that everything went down. Oh. <laughs> Destroyed the see? whole situation. But yeah. you see, that's yeah, the that dark was, side of the, that's the dark yeah, side of, the, yeah, of that. I, it well, just came to me, yes. As you were saying, it just said boing. That's so. There was a lesson there. Well, right. we're just about out of time. Uh, I don't want to get cut off um, in mid in mid sentence here. So, um, and let, you know, I'll let you, you know, kind of wrap things up and uh, tell people uh, how to get in touch with you or mention any anything you're doing uh, that you know you might want them to uh, check out. So why don't you do that, Diane? Okay. Um, well, I uh, my my book is available. It's called The Real Brass Ring: Change Your Life Course Now, and it's you know very dramatic journey, but it also has a lot of lessons and a lot of education in it. And it's available on Amazon.com, BarnesandNoble.com. You can also find it through my website. Um, I've created what I hope to be um, a sanctuary for midlife transformation, which is still in still developing and growing. And that's at LiveYourEverything.com. And um, we'd love to hear from you. And if you can join us on Facebook, LinkedIn, uh, Twitter, um, we're uh, in all the major social media. Well, thank you very much. Thank you so much uh, for having thank, me. My pleasure. My pleasure. My guest is 
in Diane Biscoff James, and uh, she does many things. Uh, the Real Brass Ring is her is her book, and uh, please uh, you know check out her website as well. Uh, she, she obviously, from hearing her, she's probably a great coach, and uh, you know, so find her where she's traveling. Uh, do you have your schedule in the uh, website as well? I do, I do. We're where going to get, California next doing? week. Um, Conscious Life Expo is next week in California, and then after that we're coming to Chicago for the Body, Mind, Spirit Expos. Well, thanks again for being on the show. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Uh, you were listening to Getting On.